Hi. I want to start off by saying that this is my talk, and so, I mean, it's my story and not Technalia's story, even though I work for Technalia. What I want to talk about is a bit more about the motivation. As Anders already explained, it might have been better if our talks had been mixed up a little bit more. So I want to start with a story. Let's imagine that we have a time traveler who comes to us from 1665. So this is kind of at the, you know, at one of the good times from the previous major scientific revolution. It also happens to be a plague year. And he comes to us, and there are a number of things that seem completely different and bewildering to him, things that he hasn't seen before, stuff that's hard to understand about our society. For example, online dating, and suddenly discovering that what he thought was going to be his dream girlfriend turns out to be a 60-year-old man from Tulsa. <laughs> but there are also a lot of things that haven't changed at all, despite all of our science, everything that's happened since 1665, we still depend very much on the environment, the conditions of the environment, whether they're good for life, not so good for life. Disease, of course. And we're prone to violent threats. We think of Earth as this one place that's really hospitable to us, the place we're perfectly adapted to. But even there, well, it's clear we can't live in extreme cold, well, not without a lot of protection. Some extremophiles can, but we can't. Similarly, extreme heat is not our home. This also exists on Earth, but we can't go there. Extreme depth, high altitude. And think about it, even water, one of the basic essentials of life, is dangerous. You fall into it, you drown. Many sailors drown. And then there are these giant catastrophes, things that can happen to our species, Things that happen outside of our control, this impact of a giant meteor, for example, a planet killer. It could happen. It has happened before. So why wouldn't it happen now? And then there are the things that of our own making. <laughs> so, yeah, we've got this one. Then we tend to forget this these days because, you know, the Cold War is over, so we don't think about it as much. But it's still a very real possibility. Global thermonuclear war, sure, yeah. The stockpiles are still there. And then, as a recent Nature article pointed out, there's an increasing danger of biological agents, biological warfare in our world right now, which is particularly dangerous to a species, like most species on Earth, that are really confined to a very small set of differentiations. We're very similar, all of us, in our biological makeup. So obviously, this is a big danger to a species like that. And then, I can't leave this out, and we've heard about it plentifold now in the first talk, so I don't have to say as much about it as I otherwise would have. But yeah, I mean, we think of our good friends, the artificial intelligence, coming along. And then we think, these are going to be really beneficial for us. They'll help us out. They'll help us with all of our problems. But is that perhaps a little bit naive? It's kind of like apes thinking humans are going to come along. I'm sure they're going to be nirvana for apes. They're going to make everything better for us. And that's where you end up. And next up, AGI. So, well, we'll just have to see where that goes, and I'm not going to repeat the entire first talk. Well, what we have here is an urgent need to do something because we live in very precarious conditions. This is the threat of extinction that looms over any species that depends utterly on one finely tuned set of constraints from our environment. Temperature, pressure, breathable air, water, which, as we saw, can also be dangerous, and flora, fauna, whatever we need as nutrition for, those, for that body, this that sustains us, that sustains what our thoughts are tied to. On a personal level, I mean, I've been talking about human extinction and species threats now, but on a personal level, we all suffer from decrepitude, incapacity, and death, and so do our loved ones, and we cannot avoid understanding that this causes a lot of suffering. We can say, yes, this is the normal state of things. Everyone dies, but you can't ignore the fact that it still does cause suffering. It's very clear. So even if you don't think that there's a moral obligation to society to do something about it because, hey, it's natural, we certainly have a personal obligation. If you see your own relatives suffering, if you think they're getting Alzheimer's disease, or if you think they're, you know, they're suffering from a terminal illness, you would like to do something about that. So let's go back to 1665. If you were this time traveler, and you were thinking about, well, what is going on here? Millions of people are dying. 
Is this just fate that's come upon us? Do we have to accept this? Or is it okay to try to do something about it, or at least escape, be one of the few lucky ones that survive? I think that there is indeed a noble purpose to trying to decrease human suffering and increase well-being. So, how do you do that? There are a lot of different approaches. And one of them, of course, is another one we'll see today, or at least at this meeting, uh, sense. Try to solve it by solving aging. Or you can do anything from cloning human organs and replacing them. We have a kidney transplant up here to, well, cryonics, where we think if we can only store ourselves until science gets better, then eventually we'll be rejuvenated, we'll come back and you know, run across the beach there. So, <clears throat> it might be a virtual beach, I don't know, but it, yeah, it's a good idea. But there's a problem here. Everything that I've explained so far is not solved by solving aging. It's not as easy as that. Aging solve, Anti-aging solves a few things, if you can manage that. But it doesn't solve some of our major shortfalls. It doesn't deal with our dependence on this particular environment and the resources that are around us. And if everyone lives longer, of course, that's going to become an increasing problem because then you have more people who depend on exactly the same environment, exactly those same resources. Also, it does nothing to deal with our intellectual limitations. And as you see here, sometimes we're already being beaten. It does nothing about traumatic incident. You can halt aging and you can still be run over by a car. It does nothing against disease. I mean, that's maybe going a little far, because perhaps if you have a much better body that is more prone to protecting itself against disease agents, sure, you may do better. But I think there's still good cause to believe that there are diseases that could fail you. So what is the inescapable conclusion? If you really want to deal with this problem, if you're not scared of just taking the leap, then you have to say the only way you can solve it is by solving the actual underlying problem, which is our dependence on one specific substrate. So if you want to solve the problem, you need to be able to move the mind to another substrate. You need to be able to move it out of this brain into another brain, just as Anders was describing before. Now, is the, is the brain enough? Is the mind enough? And a question came up about that during, after Anders talk, obviously. Um, I think that we can all agree that the mind is very important, even if we're not entirely sure what we call the entire experience of cognition or mind or self-awareness. We do know that at least our memories and our experiences are what makes us who we are and is what differentiates us one person from the other. So if we can at least save those and store those, I think this gets very close to the essence of who we are. This is a matter of addressing our most personal and precious possessions. And you can underline this by talking about people who still have a living body, persons who suffer from dementia, but who are losing their experience and who they are, their personalities. And cryonicists will agree, okay, there are two kinds of death. There is biological death, but there is the more important information-theoretic death. You can be dead even when you're still alive, or, like a cryonics patient, you may seem dead, but not be dead. Why does this seem so strange? It seems strange because we're talking about the brain. If we weren't talking about the brain, it wouldn't be strange at all. If you have an old car, you don't keep improving it forever. You eventually move to a new car, you take your favorite Garfield off the window and stick it in the other car. You move from one laptop to another by moving your favorite data. I think <clears throat> an important point to make is that the challenge, the scientific challenge of moving data out of a brain, extracting information, and putting it into another representation is not intrinsically more challenging than solving all of the problems of aging. Here we have George Williams, who wrote an interesting book explaining why there may be a synchronization between all the different causes of senescence. Basically, to just boil it down to a few words, if any system in the body works better than all the rest, if any system is more optimized, can live longer, there's evolutionary pressure for it to just become just as bad as the worst part of your system, so that all the systems pretty much line up in terms of their synchronized senescence. Well, what it means is that you end up with a, a frustrating game of whack-a-mole, 
where you have to solve a whole bunch of different problems. Every time you solve one of them, another problem pops up. In the last slide, you saw an aging patient and you saw a young kid who was suffering from cancer. Those two patients, while they have a similar uh, ailment, the treatment won't be the same, won't have the same result for each patient just because of this problem. The young patient may gain decades. The aging patient probably will gain perhaps a year, maybe five years. Something else will come along and kill him. So, besides it being a problem that may not be any more complicated than trying to address aging, it also solves a number of other problems. This is really about the big picture. It's about how we become less dependent on one specific substrate, one specific environment. So, if you can manage this, if you can move the mind from one physical substrate to another, then you gain the possibility of doing real redundancy, of giving it multiple systems in which to exist. Um, like, I mean, this here, of course, what you see is the redundancy in the brain itself, that a system is subdivided over many, many neurons, but it's still all within one head. So then you have the ability to do backup. You can take that as which, what is most personal and precious to us and move it to another system entirely. That means you have the ability to live in different environments and you're not dependent on exactly the same environmental conditions. So if you want to live out in space, you don't need a suit. You can have a different body. If you want to live out there and have an entire culture, you don't need biospheres. This is all outdated technology. This is ancient. Who needs that? It takes a lot more time to construct all of this than to figure out how to move what we have in here into something else. So you could live in a physical environment or a virtual environment. Travel is telepresence. You can move the information around at light speed. You can adapt your senses and expand your cognitive functions. Now, there is an approach that Anders was talking about. This approach is currently, I would say, the canonical one, the, the, the canonical whole brain emulation. We had that talk in Oxford, a workshop, where we discussed how you could make these patient-specific neuroprostheses. And it is a model for success because it's based on the one system we know, that we know how it wor that it works. I'm sorry, not how it works, but that it works. It's not completely unlike one of the ongoing studies of Theodore Berger, who's trying to build a hippocampus replacement, basically a neuroprosthesis for a damaged hippocampus. And there are significant advances occurring right now, especially in the field of neuroinformatics, that help us along this path. There's all the recent interest in the human connectome, the interest in discovering what are the, the, all the pathways in the brain, what are all the connections, where are they, what do they do, where do they lead. And in C. elegans, we have the full connectome. Neuroinformatics is also leading us to an understanding of how we can create computers capable of running human brain size emulations, eventually, and it is getting better and better at that, as well as developing new types of quantitative tools that will help neuroscientists, clinicians, neuroengineers to work with neural data the same way that engineers in aerospace do their models before they run any more uh, tests in wind tunnels, and how chemists work with modern computing tools to design new compounds before they ever hit the workbench. When we have virtual brain laboratories like this, that's what I like to call it, it becomes possible for neuroscientists to test their models in a better way. It becomes possible for clinicians to test new treatments, surgical treatments, pharmaceutical treatments, etc., and for us to investigate problems such as autism, depression, and Parkinson's disease, just to name a few. <clears throat> oh, I'm a clicker problem here. Okay. Another important advancement is in the area of extracting this large-scale information that we need about the structure of the brain, and Anders was already talking about that to a large degree. Here we have an example, which is the automated tape-collecting lathe ultramicrotome developed at Harvard. Um, this is, uh, let me see if I can get it to run again. Uh, well, I'm having some trouble getting the mouse on the screen here. Oh, there we go. So, this is a, sl a stack of slices that was made with this machine up here 
from a, a brain that was basically put in plastic and then reconstructed. Well, it's not reconstructed here, but these are just the stacks of slices. And uh, you can see that it's very detailed. This is electromicroscopy. You get to see individual synapses. Now, a different example, if I can move the mouse off of that so that I can click forward, is the knife edge scanning microscope, which Anders addressed also to some degree. Uh, this was built in, at Texas A&M. And uh, it does the same sort of thing, but at a different resolution. It's at the light microscope resolution. So you can see individual dendrites and, and axons, but you can't see synapses, for instance. But on the flip side, it has the capacity now to run an entire mouse brain through this. And they have done this. And they have taken the data from an entire mouse brain with some caveats, because there are problems of lighting, of uh, staining. And so there's some data loss. But yeah, they're getting there. Oh, that's <clears throat> not what I intended to do. OK, this is always difficult with these. There we go. Now, if you have any system like that, you need to be able to verify or validate that the algorithms work if you're going to reconstruct from that data. Reconstructing from this structural data is difficult because how do you test your algorithms? We don't have any large scale data sets that we've manually checked to do this with. But you can use a program such as this, NetMorph is one that I happen to have developed in my lab, uh, to validate by creating phantom data sets. So you have something that has a realistic way of growing neurons so that you get the same kind of complications of many dendrites wrapped around other dendrites that you can test whether your reconstruction algorithm works. Now, that was the structure side. And before I finish, I have to address the function side somewhat. This is the other pillar of whole brain emulation. That's a pillar where we've had some more trouble because the regular way of doing functional recording in brains is complicated. It's fraught with all sorts of scary issues. You stick a bunch of electrodes in there. That means you need to do surgery. Surgery is scary, and sometimes it can be dangerous. Chronic implantation is a problem. All sorts of stuff happens when you leave something in a brain for a long time. Power supply. How do you get the power in there? Then scale and bandwidth. You can only access a few neurons. The bandwidth isn't very great. Spatial and temporal resolution. We really want to address the whole brain. So this is a problem. But there are some new opportunities out there. If we take a step back and look at it from an open perspective, then we can see that if we use something else, something completely different, in this case nanotechnology, quantum dots, it can be possible to access a much larger scale at higher resolution if you inject these kinds of components and basically use them to turn biological signals that are hard to read into something that is easier to scan with an advanced imaging technology. Similarly, we could use high Tesla MRI. This gets us almost down to the nanoscale, but not quite. Or molecular nanotechnology, if we think that the best thing to do is to put a bunch of uh, small machines into the brain so that we can see what's going on there. Now, I'm almost done. The most important thing that we need to figure out right now is what is the actual data that we need to get out of the brain? What, are, what is the state of the mind? How do we represent it? What are the transition functions that get us from one state to the next state? And what are the update functions that des describe for us how these transition functions change as we learn things? And we can think maybe it's in the population activity. Maybe we have to look at spike times of neurons. And maybe we have to look at the membrane potentials as they travel through the morpho morphology of the neurons themselves or even deeper. I just want to show this attribution of all the different slides that I've used and things. <laughs> you can't read that. And then to thank these people here. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, please come forward. There is, there is one. Yeah. Um, so I really enjoyed your presentation, but I had a question because it's a, it's a meme that seems to have come up in a couple of the talks so far. And I'm going to paraphrase it. You can tell me if I have it right, and then we can discuss it. And the meme that I thought I heard was one of the benefits of whole brain emulation would be that we would have this wonderful ability to do tests and experiments and 
try new treatments that, that we might not be able to do now. And the thing that, that I have an ethical question about that, which is that if you have a brain emulated at, at a level that makes it possible to do those sorts of experiments and tests, what's the difference between doing them on that whole brain, on that emulated brain, and doing them on a human brain? There is a very important difference. Right now, if you want to test any pharmaceutical product, for example, eventually you're going to have to do clinical trials with humans. This means you have to test it on actual, real, biological humans. Something goes wrong, you can never back out. If you do this on a whole brain emulation, something goes wrong, you can back out. So, even if you think there is an ethical issue, as there always is, even in clinical trials with us, at least you can back out. You have a backup. You know where you are. You've got the state. You can correct your problem. So, would you give the, the emulated brains the choice as to whether to participate in those virtual clinical trials? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I always like to just kind of weasel out and not talk about those things, but the truth is, of course, that I should. And, you know, I often point to Anders and say, he's the philosopher, he should be answering that question. But, uh, but my personal feeling is, yeah, you know, if you've got something that can think the way we can and is conscious, then of course you should give them the same sorts of considerations that you do to biological intelligence. What is, what's the difference there, Thank really? You. That was a perfect answer. Thank you very much. One more? Ah. Have you developed any strategies for maintaining continuity during a, for a transfer? I mean, copying a brain would be an amazing breakthrough, but if it's merely a copy and you destroy the original, then that person's dead for all intents and purposes. So what about the idea of continuity? The idea of continuity, yeah, that's also a big debatable one. And I find that when I talk to people who really <laughs> adhere to the structural approach to whole brain emulation, they tend to say, well, this is not a problem because our sense of self is emergent. Therefore, if you're here and then later you're there, it doesn't matter. It's still continuity of the self. The whole idea of continuity is really a figment of your imagination. This may be true. I find it hard to put myself in that position. I find it very hard to feel okay with that. So even if it may be true, I understand your problem very much. And that's another reason why if you have the choice between a discontinuous way of doing a whole brain emulation and a gradual approach where, let's say, you put molecular nanotechnology in the brain and you manage to replace things bit by bit or, you know, transfer them off to something else, maybe that's the better way to go, just to be on the safe side. So I'm saying, I'm advocating, let's look at all the possibilities. Let's explore by taking a step back, taking an open perspective and looking at the objective of transferring a mind from one substrate to another rather than immediately jumping on the bandwagon of, you know, the slicing and everything and saying that's got to be the way to go. That's my take. If, if there's time for, for another. Um, I, I'm a little bit um, nervous about your, your use of the word transfer. So, um, and it relates to the continuity question. It seems to me that if there's an illusion there, it would be the copy believing it to be the original. That would be where the illusion is. Um, so I, for one, would, would not be willing to have my brain sliced up in order to make any number of copies. Um, and I, I think that any, any wise member of the audience would be equally resistant because what you're, not, what you're doing is not transferring the original, you're copying the content of the original, but you're not preserving the original on, on that scenario. If indeed you use the slicing approach, then yes, the original is, is lost, if, if that's the way you do it. Even if you don't actually do the slicing, the copy is still a copy, it's not the original. If you make a copy, then you have another brain, which in my opinion would have its own set of self-awarenesses. There's no reason why you would say that's any less than you know, a biological brain, if, unless you believe that there's something intrinsic about the biology. On the upside, if you did not the levels that Anders said at 2050, but maybe the ones that are at 2100 or 2200 or something like that, I mean, you might have to get a finer level of detail um, to really accomplish what you're talking about as opposed to what he's talking about. But in any case, I think the right model here, the right way to think about it is creating identical twins, not creating more originals. If you don't find a truly gradual way of doing it, maybe that's the case. Maybe then it has to be something like identical twins. It depends on the process, and it depends on a lot of things that we don't understand or know yet. But it is my understanding, or at least my feeling is, that if you do copy all the essential amounts of information that you need to represent what a brain is, and you create another version somewhere that's operational in the same way that we are, 
that that will be a fully functioning brain. That is something with awareness, with uh, the ability to think and consciousness.